Perhaps we have spent too much time indoors of late. You look penned up, anxious. Perhaps we need to shift some of your training from history to something more hands-on, more visceral. I was thinking philosophy. Philosophy is an important field of study. I believe it is time for a field exercise outside of the Palinaeum. Now? It's so late. I told you philosophy was a hands-on art. I'll prove it to you. Come. Yasna ignored the calls of rickshaw pullers and palanquin porters. She walked slowly in a beautiful dress of violet and gold, Shalon following in blue silk. Yasna hadn't taken time to have her hair done, and she wore it loose, cascading across her shoulders, almost scandalous in its freedom. They walked the Relinsa, the main thoroughfare that led down the hillside in switchbacks, connecting Conclave and Port. Despite the late hour, the roadway was crowded, and many of the men who walked here seemed to bear the night inside of them. They were gruffer, more shadowed of face. Shouts still rang through the city, but those carried the night in them too, measured by the roughness of their words and the sharpness of their tones. The steep slanted hillside that formed the city was no less crowded with buildings than always, yet these too seemed to draw in the night blackened, like stones burned by a fire, hollow remains. Brightness, shouldn't we call for a palanquin? A palanquin might inhibit the lesson. I'll be all right learning that lesson during the day, if you wouldn't mind. Yasna stopped, looking off the Relinsa and toward a darker side street. What do you think of that roadway, Shalon? It doesn't look particularly appealing to me. And yet, it is the most direct route from the Relinsa to the theater district. Is that where we're going? We aren't going anywhere. We are acting, pondering, and learning. Shalon followed nervously. The night swallowed them. Only the occasional light from late-night taverns and shops offered illumination. Yasna wore her black, fingerless glove over her soul caster, hiding the light of its gemstones. Shalon found herself creeping. Her slippered feet could feel every change in the ground underfoot, each pebble and crack. She looked about nervously as they passed a group of workers gathered around a tavern doorway. Brightness. Shalon asked in a hushed tone. When we are young, Yasna said, we want simple answers. There is no greater indication of youth, perhaps, than the desire for everything to be as it should, as it has ever been. Shalon frowned, still watching the men by the tavern over her shoulder. The older we grow, the more we question. We begin to ask why, and yet we still want the answers to be simple. We assume that the people around us, adults, leaders, will have those answers. Whatever they give often satisfies us. I was never satisfied. I wanted more. You were mature. What you describe happens to most of us as we age. Indeed, it seems to me that aging, wisdom, and wondering are synonymous. The older we grow, the more likely we are to reject the simple answers, unless someone gets in our way and demands they be accepted regardless. Yasna halted. Then she briefly pulled back her glove using the light beneath to reveal the street around her. 
The gemstones on her hand, larger than bronze, blazed like torches, red, white, and gray. Is it wise to be showing your wealth like that brightness? No, it is most certainly not, particularly not here. You see, this street has gained a particular reputation lately. On three separate occasions during the last two months, theatergoers who chose this route to the main road were accosted by footpads. In each case, the people were murdered. Shallan felt herself grow pale. The City Watch has done nothing. Taravangian has sent them several pointed reprimands, but the captain of the watch is cousin to a very influential Light Eyes in the city, and Taravangian is not a terribly powerful king. Some suspect that there's more going on, that the footpads might be bribing the watch. The politics of it are irrelevant at the moment, for as you can see, no members of the watch are guarding the place, despite its reputation. Yasna pulled her glove back on, plunging the roadway back into darkness. Shalon blinked, her eyes adjusting. How foolish. Would you say it is for us to come here? Two undefended women wearing costly clothing and bearing riches. Very foolish. Yasna, can we go, please? Whatever lesson you have in mind isn't worth this. Yasna drew her lips into a line then looked toward a narrow, darker alleyway off the road they were on. It was almost completely black, now that Yasna had replaced her glove. You're at an interesting place in your life, Shalon. You're old enough to wonder, to ask, to reject what is presented to you simply because it was presented to you. But you also cling to the idealism of youth. You feel there must be some single, all-defining truth and you think that once you find it, all that once confused you will suddenly make sense. Yasna walked into the narrow alleyway. Yasna, what are you doing? This is philosophy in action, child. Come with me. Shalon hesitated at the mouth of the alleyway, her heart thumping, her thoughts muddled. The wind blew and bells rang like frozen raindrops shattering against the stones. In a moment of decision, she rushed after Yasna, preferring company, even in the dark, to being alone. The shrouded glimmer of the soul caster was barely enough to light their way, and Shalon followed in Yasna's shadow. Noise from behind. Shalon turned with a start to see several dark forms crowding into the alley. Oh, Stormfather, she whispered. Why? Why was Yasna doing this? Shaking, Shalon grabbed at Yasna's dress with her free hand. Other shadows were moving in front of them from the far side of the alley. They grew closer, grunting, splashing through foul, stagnant puddles. Chill water had already soaked Shalon's slippers. Yasna stopped moving. The frail light of her cloaked soul caster reflected off metal in the hands of their stalkers. Swords or knives. These men meant murder. You didn't rob women like Shalon and Yasna, women with powerful connections, then leave them alive as witnesses. Men like these were not the gentlemen bandits of romantic stories. They lived each day knowing that if they were caught, they would be hanged. Paralyzed by fear, Shalon couldn't even scream. Stormfather, Stormfather, Stormfather. And now, the lesson. She whipped off her glove. The sudden light was nearly blinding. Shalon raised a hand against it, stumbling back against the alley wall. There were four men around them. Not the men from the tavern entrance, but others. Men she hadn't noticed watching them. She could see the knives now, and she could also see the murder in their eyes. Her scream finally broke free. The men grunted at the glare, but shoved their way forward. A thick-chested man with a dark beard came up to Yasna, weapon raised. She calmly reached her hand out, fingers splayed, and pressed it against his chest as he swung a knife. Shalon's breath caught in her throat. Yasna's hand sank into the man's skin, and he froze. A second later, he burned. No, he became fire, transformed into flames in an eye blink. 
Rising around Yasna's hand, they formed the outline of a man with head thrown back and mouth open. For just a moment, the blaze of the man's death outshone Yasna's gemstones. Shalan's scream trailed off. The figure of flames was strangely beautiful. It was gone in a moment, the fire dissipating into the night air, leaving an orange afterimage in Shalan's eyes. The other three men began to curse, scrambling away, tripping over one another in their panic. One fell. Yasna turned casually, brushing his shoulder with her fingers as he struggled to his knees. He became crystal, a figure of pure, flawless quartz, his clothing transformed along with him. The diamond in Yasna's soul caster faded, but there was still plenty of stormlight left to send rainbow sparkles through the transformed corpse. The other two men fled in opposite directions. Yasna took a deep breath, closing her eyes, lifting her hand above her head. Shalan held her safe hand to her breast, stunned, confused, terrified. Stormlight shot from Yasna's hand like twin bolts of lightning, symmetrical. One struck each of the footpads and they popped, puffing into smoke. Their empty clothing dropped to the ground. With a sharp snap, the smoke stone crystal on Yasna's soul caster cracked, its light vanishing, leaving her with just the diamond and the ruby. The remains of the two footpads rose into the air, small billows of greasy vapor. Yasna opened her eyes, looking eerily calm. She tugged her glove back on, using her safe hand to hold it against her stomach and sliding her freehand fingers in. Then she calmly walked back the way they had come. She left the crystal corpse kneeling with hand upraised, frozen forever. Shalan pried herself off the wall and hastened after Yasna, sickened and amazed. Too overwhelmed to demand answers, she stood silent, free hand held to the side of her head, trying to control her trembling and her gasping breaths as Yasna called for a palanquin. One came eventually and the two women climbed in. The bearers carried them toward the Relinsa, their steps jostling Shalan and Yasna, who sat across from one another in the palanquin. That was horrible, Shalan finally said, hand still held to her breast. It was one of the most awful things I've ever experienced. You killed four men. Four men who were planning to beat, rob, kill, and possibly rape us. You tempted them into coming for us. Did I force them to commit any crimes? You showed off your gemstones. Can a woman not walk with her possessions down the street of a city? At night? Through a rough area displaying wealth? You all but asked for what happened. Does that make it right? Yasna said, leaning forward. Do you condone what the men were planning to do? Of course not. But that doesn't make what you did right either. And yet those men are off the street. The people of this city are that much safer. The issue that Teravangian has been so worried about has been solved. And no more theatergoers will fall to those thugs. How many lives did I just save? I know how many you just took. And through the power of something that should be holy. Philosophy in action. An important lesson for you. Yasna leaned back, watching the city pass. I did not do this just to prove a point, child. Tonight's actions came about because I chose this path, not because of anything I felt you needed to see. However, the opportunity also presented a chance for instruction, for questions. Am I a monster or am I a hero? Did I just slaughter four men? Or did I stop four murderers from walking the streets? Does one deserve to have evil done to her by consequence of putting herself where evil can reach her? Did I have a right to defend myself? Or was I just looking for an excuse to end lives? You will spend the next week researching it and thinking on it. If you wish to be a scholar, a true scholar who changes the world, then you will need to face questions like this. There will be times when you must make decisions that churn your stomach. 
I'll have you ready to make those decisions.